this book to me is a big challenge. I have to confess, I have a big problem with two things, dates and and names, especially names. Um, and this book, this chapter in particular, throw a bunch of names at us that I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I'm always trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Who is who, who is who he reincarnated and in this web that is our reincarnations, then how we are somehow 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 related with individuals from previous experiences and the blessing, the forgiveness of of God is expressed in this thing that we call reincarnation that allow us to come back, reunite with those to whom we have things to adjust and repair the mistakes of the past, um, make relationship relationships that have been harmed by our selfishness, by our pride, and reorganize them with the greatest tool that we have in our hands, which is compassion, which is forgiveness, especially forgiveness, and charity in the global sense. Chapter 19 is a little bit more of reviewing history, and I don't find that many great um, lessons. Chapter 20 is a lot more interesting in terms of collecting lessons for ourselves. If I can move from the introduction straight to the conclusion with chapter, especially with chapter 19, I would say that the lessons here for us that, as I said, they're all entangled in this spire, spire web of previous and present relationships. As we know, that is done just by coincidence. They, in the spiritual world, they didn't throw a bunch of names up in the air and just pick a bunch to be together, unite as a family. Things happen for a reason, but more important than the reason for an objective. To seek to revisit our past is absolutely contraindicated contra and counterproductive. As you can see now, uh, we're just going to find ourselves in a worse situation, morally speaking, than what we are today. And why should we go and look for that? Why do we have to try to understand who I was, who the one who is next to me was, who my kids were, who my parents were, and it's it not going to produce anything of goodness. And, and the only really solution is what Christ has taught us. Perhaps his greatest lesson is the necessity of forgiveness. Forgiveness being absolutely the, the ultimate key of liberation. Key of liberation from our past, and the key that we establish harmonious relationship uh, in the present and one for on forward. If you cannot change the past, we cannot redo the what, what we have done before. We can repair now and move on in harmony. And that is primarily the objectives of our reincarnations in the law of progress. And the necessity of forgiveness, taking Jesus, his teachings outside of the religious aspect and in our and put it in our daily lives. Outside of any religiosity, just understand that as we can read to this book, the exercise of forgiveness is an absolute necessity. And we can see the war today. You can see the wars going on today. We can see the conflicts that's lasted 7,000 years or more already 
that it's all happening today because we are still unable to exercise forgiveness. If this book, this special disrupt teaches us something is that forgiveness is absolutely essential. The idea that history repeats itself is ridiculous. The, the truth is because of our inability to forgive, we do not liberate, liberate ourselves from the past. So the past continues to be the present in the absence of forgiveness and gives the impression that it's history repeating itself. But indeed, it's us not leaving history be behind and move on into the present and towards the, fu the future. As we read, we're gonna get a lot of names. If you need to ask me who is who, please go ahead and ask who, who is who. Um, <laughs> there's a good chance that I will we have to go back and try to figure out who is who, because there's a lot of names in passion, in especially those who are reincarnated now with different names in the past, and I know those entanglement of relationships. Um, let's read and see if can Julia. We know who Julia is. Is the young, the young boy, right? Yes. That is now back in the spiritual world, and the young boy that in the past. Um, Is the one who who basically um, stole um, Lena. That is now again we go Odelia. That from from Estevas. This one that is still in the spiritual world, having a hard time with the the prospect of, of forgiveness. So, okay. Who's going to do the reinforce today? Yes. Okay. I will. Um, I will. Okay. Uh, we may need a little, read a little long um, than, than usual, but um, okay. let's see if I can read this. Okay. Chapter 19, Pain and Surprise. Julio, Julio, show yourself, you coward, screamed Mario Silva as if possessed. Perhaps sensing the sympathy that Amario had, one from us due to the calmness with which he was handling the situation. Silva, continue calling rebelliously. Show yourself and unmask this rascal who's trying to win us over. I really do hate you, Julio, but you have to show yourself and accuse your heartless murderer. I'm oh, sorry. It's okay. Clarenzo tried to restrain him gently. But like a wild coat, Silva, Silva spurred around aimlessly and continued yelling, Julio, Julio. No, Julio did not answer the call. Nonetheless, to our surprise, someone else did. As if she had been called by name, Sil Sister Blandina appeared in person and stood beside us. She enveloped us in gentle light and we settled down, perplexed except for Clarenzo who had kept his calm as if he had been expecting her visit. After greeting us, Blandina stated humbly, Brothers, for Jesus' sake, listen to me. Julio is under our watch care. He is sick, afflicted. Your individual appeals have affected him. He can come to you mentally, but he is going, to th he is going through the difficult trial of readjustment at the moment. I have come to plead for your charity. Take pity on someone who is making an effort to forget what he was yesterday so that he may be effectively regenerated tomorrow. There was so much concern and tenderness in that appeal that the vibrations of the surroundings changed suddenly. I began to move clearly grabs the dark plot of this living novel. Leo, the sickly boy, was the spirit who had reincarnated as the son of the friend with whom he quarreled in the past. I couldn't dwell on this fact for long, because Sylvia, probably rebelling against the emotions that had overcome our souls, began complaining again. Angel or woman, 
I won't try to fight the sorcery. I won't fight it, but I have to throw this thief into the abyss because of his preposterous lies. Julio could stay in heaven or hell in the custody of archangels or demons, but I demand that the whole truth come out. I call on Lena as my witness. May Lena show herself. Let her take the stand. If we have been called here by the faith that binds us each to each other, let that perfidious woman be heard as well. Assuming spiritual leadership of the group, our instructor invited everyone. Lena is nearby and let's go. We all obeyed within the prenumbrium of the familiar bedroom. Amaro's second wife was still subjugated to the first. While Odelia seemed even more ra rancorous and hardened than before, Sumila seemed more disheartened. Lorenzo embraced Mario like a kindly father and nodding toward the sick woman, he explained, compose yourself, my friend. Lena Flores is suffering in the forge of struggle and sacrifice in order to be healed. Quench the fire of hate, hatred that burns in your heart. Allow new understanding to benefit your ulcerated soul. We mustn't stand in the way of someone who is seeking the regeneration she needs. In light of Mario's nervous, ag agonized look, the minister con considered, Lena, today is having immense difficulties trying to maintain a worthy marriage and in overcoming huge obstacles. She is laying the foundation for her upcoming motherhood. Let's help her with our vibrations of understanding and care. When we love rightly, the happiness of the one we love comes first before anything else. Our group went a little further. Blandina continued praying. Clarenzo approached Sumila with respectful attention and showed her gout. Sad face to Mario, who shouted in dread upon seeing her. Sumila. So Zumila is Lena reincarnated. The minister caressed her head and replied, that's right. She has returned with Romario to make painful reparations. Their marriage has not been a bed of roses, but an association of spiritual interests for the regenerative endeavor. Romario accepted the commitment of leading her back to a dignity as a woman by assisting her in her silent suffering. Stupefied, Sylvia explained, exclaimed, does that mean Zumila has betrayed me twice? Don't call it betrayal, clarified Clarenzo calmly. You need to understand, before Mario he period appeared that were incompatible with the responsibility entrusted to him. Now he is compelled to respond, although constrained, to the requirements of edifying nature, which he cannot rightly avoid. Lena Flores needs someone to remove Remand, remand her to renewing service so that she in turn can aid Julio appropriately. We are all one another's debtors. Souls perfect themselves from group to group like tiny constellations orbiting around the great around the great sun, Jesus Christ. Like a planet that is far from the center of a solar system, you have left the orbit of all companions of evolution. And because of vibrations of love and hate, you have fallen into the center of energies in which Leonardo Pierce and Lola Abiruri await your cooperation so that they may be liberated before the law. In the past, Mario came between Zumila and Julio, thus planting the lacerating thorns between them. Now he must bring them back together as a loving family so that as a mother and son, they can readjust themselves in sanctifying love. In the past, you isolated Leonardo from Lola's loving assistance, thereby hindering your own evolution. Prepare yourself in faith to bring them together again in the domestic temple as son and mother, so that they may be redeemed for the blessing of true love. Our actions are weighed in the balance of divine justice. We cannot fool the Supreme Lord. Our debts must be redeemed penny by penny. Interesting. Okay. Okay, so what you hear is what I said, this entanglement of relationships that go back and forth, back and forth, waiting, 
for forgiveness, at least on one side, ideally for both sides, on all the mistakes that I have done in the past. So you see this entanglement like in a soap opera of, you know, John, Mary, John loves Mary, who loves, you know, John, who, loved, who, who marries Silva, who loves, and, and goes back and forth in a, in a, inability that we have out of our pride and our lack of harmonies to accept the desires of individuals and try to break relationships for our own sake and create this tremendous amount of responsibility that we carry, right? So we have there that <clears throat> steps one time uh, I'm sorry, uh, Leonardo one time uh, poisoned um, Steve, Steve's for, for a woman who then he abandoned and the woman goes somewhere else and then and then Steve's before being poisoned by Leonardo had a relationship with Lena uh, they were actually got married with the one that is now that was then Lena and that is now uh, Zumira and um, Julio had a, an affair with with Lina and basically stole Lina from Steves, <clears throat> and then and then who is now uh, Amaro at the time Armando uh, had an affair with the same woman Lina and Julio could not outstand that and commit suicide by drinking poison. And uh, and now they are entangled together. Some discarnate, some incarnate. Zoom, uh, Lina is incarnate as Mira. Julio was reincarnated as <clears throat> the the son of Amaro, who is now um, Armando, who is now uh, Amaro, and now is back in the spiritual world, being receiving treatment in the place called La. The Benson, which basically a, we could say is a kind of an orphanage on the spiritual world, who receives um, spirits that described as a, as a child, but children, but old enough to have a self identity, meaning they identify themselves as a nine years old, or eight years old, as opposed to someone who discarnated kind of as a very young age, as a, um, a three, four months old that still does not have a developed self-identity for that reincarnation, go back to the spiritual world and likely will reassume the identity of pre the, the previous reincarnation. So as an example, if I die at the age of nine, 10, and go back to the spiritual world, Chances are that I will recognize myself as a nine, ten years old because I have a well-formed self-identity. But if I die as a ten months old, as a six months old, chances are that I have not formed an identity for that reincarnation yet. So likely I would go back to assume the relationship by, by the identity of the very last reincarnation that I had. So Julio right now is in the spiritual world, being treated in this place, Larda Benson. He had drowned, and Zubira is partially responsible for for his death, for not being attentive to him. <clears throat> and in reality, in her mind, did not like Julio when she was extremely Julio extremely jealous of Julio and, and, and his relationship with his father that was, of course, that is uh, Zubira's uh, husband. Again, it's entanglement of, of relationships. So a lot of names, um, individuals that re come back to us from one incarnation to, to the next with different names, of course, and it's hard to put it all together. Remember everything together. But again, the lesson that I can take from here is the inability to forgive. And for as long as we seek justice, 
whatever we believe in being justice, chances are we are going to make a mistake and we're going to compromise ourselves even more with the divine laws. And the only solution is to leave justice at the hands of God, who has an absolute understanding perception of everything and is the only one, therefore, able to practice absolute justice. Any questions? Okay, so you can finish your chapter now. Okay. We found this brief lesson to be enormously beneficial. Amaro bowed his head, showing that he was ready to obey dictates of a higher nature, whatever they might be. Silva, on the other hand, did not seem to have grasped the truths that Clarenzo had iterated. Hypnotized as he contemplated the dear woman, he displayed his indifference. After having gasped upon her amid love and aversion, he broke the silence that had enveloped the room and screamed in desperation. No, I cannot change. I'm doomed. I shall hate the wrench who has come back. Only revenge will do. I cannot forgive. I cannot forgive. Once again in rage and, and forbearing, forbearing, like a wild animal on the loose, he shook his fist at the poor woman lying in bed in heartbreaking prostration. His spirit body was now surrounded by a dark gray aura that emitted unpleasant, disquieting rays. Lorenzo freed him from the magnetic influence with which he was stifling his energies. As soon as he found himself without the restraints that had been controlling his movements, Sylvia stepped back and exclaimed, I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand it anymore. And he ran out into the night. Lorenzo told us to follow him while he himself, with Blandina's help, lend assistance to the railroad worker and his wife. The health care worker would surely retake his dense body in a precarious state of health. And anesthetizing passes would help him. He would not be able to recall the grave experience he had had. The experience caused by his mental obstinacy could not dangerous, could have dangerous consequences. Hilario and I instantly found ourselves beside Sylvia who was being automatically drawn to his physical body like an iron molecule attracted by a magnet. He explained him carefully. We explained him carefully, examined him carefully, sorry. His chest was heaving and his breathing was labored. His heart was racing due to out of control arrhythmia. We immediately got to work, soothing his mental feel as much as possible by means of magnetic sedate sedatives, but in spite of our passes that completely enveloped him in reinvigorating energies, Mario woke up in agony, hesitant and trembling as if he had been running from a terrible inner storm. Have conscience. He took him several, it took him several minutes to get a rid, to get rid, uh, to get a grip on himself. His thoughts were in torment, nubilis. He tried to move, could, but could not. He felt like he was bolted to his bed like a corpse that has suddenly awakened. He tried to collect his thoughts, but could not do that either. He only knew that he had had a terrible nightmare, the magnitude of which he could not fathom. Drenched in sweat and afflicted, he thought he was going to die. Instinct instinctively, he prayed for divine protection. That was all it took for his soul to connect to our restorative fluids. Little by little, he was able to move again. He got up and took a tranquilizer. Frightened, he sat on the edge of the bed and immersing his head in his hands, said to himself, I'm really all messed up. Tomorrow I'm going to see a shrink. That's my only hope. Yes, I agree to myself. Hatred causes madness. Whoever strives against the good falls into the claws of perturbation and death. With that realization, we left. Lorenzo was waiting for us. We needed to continue our lesson. Okay. Okay. So you see that now, again, if you can keep up and neither can I, I'm glad to take notes. 
minus u over u uh, status, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, minus u of cos incarnate is the same spirit as, as, as status. In that encounter with the individuals of the past, revisiting to Lina, that's now uh, Zumira. He is shaken with tremendous amount of energies, most of them very dark, not good energies that it derives from his hate, from his inability to forgive. That places him in a state of completely unbalanced. When Clarence noticed that was enough for him to tolerate, he could not tolerate anymore. Uh, he kind of provided him some passes and liberate him from that moment. And um, Mario, that he, there was a nice state of uh, sonambulism, so to say, was an out of the body experience in a dream, which you would wake up and call it as a horrible nightmare. He runs back to his physical body. And when going back, through his physical body and and um, Andrano uh, observes and says that it's almost like a magnetic reaction of the physical body sucking in, pulling in that petty spirit, spirit complex. Immediately, Mario wakes up uh, with, we can see with an adrenal adrenaline rush with severe like a cardio, the heart rate is going crazy, he is sweating like nuts, as if he was in a state of panic. He was in a state of panic, uh, by definition here. <clears throat> Which shows to us, if it's any less, was that there is a strong relationship of us as the spirit with the peri spirit, the eclectical, the spirit, peri spirit complex to the physical body, how there is this strong relationship that the energies that we pass to the physical body has on a very deep um, response in that physical body. And that, and that response, response is definitely in accordance of the energies that you are sending in a state of despair, in a state of tremendous hate and desire for revenge, we do not expect anything positive, any re good positive reaction from the organic body. Uh, adrenaline is a very useful tool, it's very important for us. It is a fight and flight um, hormone that prepares us to defend to save ourselves. But in releasing it, it also has its side effects, right? The very hard, high heart rate, the the sweatness, the elevation of the blood pressure, you're ready to fight. So you need to have all that uh, energy. But when that all that energy is there and it's not there is no fight going on, it's not a really good thing. And um Mario Silver in that state of, of despair, have a recognition that he is completely unbalanced and he should go and seek uh, psychological help, uh, help, psychiatric help, to which Andre Luis says that absolutely agrees because hate creates that form of imbalance. We would not say over here that all, all of our psychological slash psychiatric um, diseases or imbalances at the result of the harmful energies that we, the spirit, peri-spirit complexes, throw into the physical body, the physical organism, but the strong relationship and the likelihood that most of our problems is because of this conflict with us with our, and our own conscience, with our lack, our 
inability to follow Christ and to practice charity, which is, again, uh, benevolence, indulgence, and forgiveness. In this case, uh, forgiveness is the great stressor. Therefore, for Mario Silva, who was uh, Esteves in the past. Um, any questions, any comments? Uh, I, yeah, I know that uh, I, I start the, this chapter with the conclusion uh, of, this, of this chapter, but I think that it does not bring much great uh, addition besides the, the necessity for forgiveness. Therefore, as long as we are unable to forgive, we keep ourselves hostage of the past, imprisoned by that past, and it's our own doing. Mario, you know, the incarnated Steves, cannot hold anyone responsible for his present suffering. He cannot say, oh, he did this for me in the past, she did that to me in the past. Yes, they did. But who is holding himself hostage in the past is him himself and no one else. And that's something that is tried to imprint in the minds of spirits that we see in our leadership meetings very often. They who find themselves in the right to exercise justice find themselves also at the same time prisoners of their own past. And when I try to explain to them that, some of them will have absolutely no ears to it, do not want to hear. Some will say that divine justice takes too long, they cannot wait for God to make justice, they have to do it themselves. But for those that from time to time we see that is receptive to the ideas of if not forgiving, which is a much harder thing to do, but at least to not pursue revenge, to not go after those that he considers to be responsible for his so present suffering, that if he just let go, they, they will feel a lot better. They start feeling a lot better that moment that we talk to them. We can see, we can hear the energy and the voices, that moment of, okay, I'll let it go. And if I cannot forgive yet, at least I'll let God take care of him or her and I, I'm going to move on with on life. We can even feel the energy and the voices when they reach that moment of liberation. And that's the process that Mario incarnate is going through now to eventually being able to let it go um, himself. The next chapter is a little bit more interesting because it usually thinks that um, there's more palpable for us. We're going to talk a little bit about centers of energies and uh, not be able to finish the chapter, but let's see what we can do. Okay. Okay, chapter 20, Conflicts of the Soul. When we arrived back at Amario's home, we were still able to observe him outside his dense body. With Clarenzo's direct assistance, he was talking with Odilia, his first wife. When Odilia saw Amario, probably with Clarenzo's help, she forgot about Zumila for a few moments and knelt down at his feet, exclaiming, Omario, throw her out. Enough of this woman in our home. She was wrenched. She has wrenched our peace. She murdered our son. She's no good for Evelina, and she's a torment to you. Staring at Zumila with a terrible look, she asked, Why are you keeping such an intruder, intruder around? A very downcast Amario had been making an effort to focus on our instructor, 
but perhaps tormented as seeing his sullen, angry first wife again, he had lost his characteristic serenity. While with us, as he discussed problems of a moral order weighing on his mind, he had maintained an invariable calmness with an aristocratic grasp of life problems. But here, in the presence of the woman who dominated his sentiments, he turned out to be more accessible to imbalance and turmoil. We could see that he wanted to respond to Odelia's accusations, but his extremely pale face betrayed inhibit inhibitorial emotion. Situated between Odelia and Sumila, he seemed di di divided between love and compassion. Odelia continued her raving with heart-trending ass in assistance, while Amario stood unmoving like a vis living statue of doubt and suffering. I was hoping that, as he had done a little while earlier with Omario, Lorenzo would take Odelia's mind back into the past in order to calm her soul. But when I asked him about it, he, he explained, no, it wouldn't work. Our drama would grow too large if we delved into the past too, too much. We need to stick to the line of work that was born from Evelina's prayer. Noticing that the railroader was ardently troubled, the minister led him away from Odelia to the bed where his body lay. The poor discarnate tried to cling to him, clamoring disconsolingly, Amario, Amario, don't leave me like this. The clock chimed 3 a.m. Amario woke up exhausted. He rubbed his eyes sleepingly and thought he could still hear the appeal vibrating in the air. Amario, Amario, I, I, the shock of it, the encounter had been too much for him. Only the last phase of his spiritual encouragement remained on his mnemonic screen, the image of, of Odelia, imploring his help. There was no trace left of his conversation with us, leaving him to the fragmental resemblance, remembrance that loomed in his consciousness as a mere dream, dream we left. Okay, thanks. Okay. Chapter 20, uh, it starts with incarnate uh, Amaro, discarnate uh, Armado. He's still uh, out of the body, have an encounter with Odilia, Amaro's first wife, who discarnate the, the, was, the, was the mother of Julio and, uh, and, and Evelina. Right, that is now back in the spiritual world, with a tremendous rage over his present wife, Zumira, asking him to abandon her, that she is evil, that she is not good, that she is destroying the household. She is still sees herself basically as the wife of Amaro and feels that she has the right of the being the mother and wife in that household. Uh, again, a problem that from time to time we see in the spirit center of the problem of attachment. We very often speak of attachment as attached to material things, as money, house, this is my house, nobody else can has the right to live in that house. But we forget that one, perhaps the most significant attachment is to relationships, to individuals, right? Ideally, most of us are unable, I don't think, perhaps most of us are unable, I'm pretty sure that I would not be able to have this, this understanding that we are all brothers and sisters in God, that we play roles of relationships as husband, wife, brother, sister, mother, father, in different relationship, relationships. But at the end, when you peel off all those labels in those relationships, we are brothers and sisters. If we had that ability, that state of mind to return to the spiritual world and say, I play the role of the husband of my present wife here. I play the role of the father of my two kids. Now I'm back to the spiritual world, I see myself as 
a brother to all of them, and I'm here to help all of them to the best of my ability in this present reincarnation for and and so on. But unfortunately, we don't. Likely, if I live here tomorrow, I can continue to see my present wife as my wife and my kids as my kids because I'm not evolved enough. Although intellectually, I do understand that now we are all brothers and sisters, but perhaps with the intelligence of the heart, emotionally, I am not to be able to do that. So, But there, there is something that you eventually conquer reach in our, uh, in our progress. <coughs> but we are strongly attached to those relationships. It creates problems. And one of the problems of <coughs> inner health is exactly the ability to, to let go of that relationship and to allow that incarnated ex-husband, that is used as a husband, to have other relationships. As an incarnated man, as an incarnated woman, we should seek to have relationships. And that created a tremendous amount of problem. She has ideas, believes to have ownership of the household, of the man that she calls her husband, of the other spirits that she calls her brother, her sons and daughters. That ownership, that inability to let it go, the attachment to that we speak very often in spirit is, is perhaps the greatest problem the spirits have once we go back to the spiritual plane. So more than attachment to material things, oh my money, oh my house, yes, that's a big problem, but the attachment to relationships, to individuals, is perhaps even more difficult. And that's what uh, Odila is, is going through now. And she tries to hold on to, hold on to now uh, Amaro. Amaro finds herself between true love that he has for Odilia and the compassion that he has for Zumira. And he's shaken in, in his and his moral strength. We see that Amaro is a spirit who is making progress, who is moving forward in the process of, rep of reparation of the mistakes of the past. He is the one who's trying to be a good husband, trying to be a, a good father, had a tremendous loving relationship with, with Julio, who is now in the spiritual world. And he is being a completer, try to complete his difficulties. But even so, when Odile comes in with all, all her petition, he finds himself kind of shaken in his moral strength, his moral uh, foundations. And Clarence protects him, uh, giving him passes and sending him back to his physical body so he can wake up and sees everything again as just as a dream. And um, not being any more imbalanced by um, Odila's petition. And even as he's waking up, he continues to hear the voice of, of Odilia uh, calling him, which again, he will see as a dream or sees as a nightmare, and he will continue his, his life. And now in the second part of this chapter, we're going to see that more interesting part, I think, that Clarence takes Leona, takes uh, Andrea Luis back into the lar of, of the ben, of Benson. Lada Benson. Continue. Okay. Yes. Sister Blandina immediately asked us to help her with little Julio whom she had entrusted to Mariana while she came looking for us. As we made our way to La de Bartau, I asked the minister about a certain enigma that had been troubling my mind. At the time of the war with Paraguay, Estevez had suffered the torch of poison as much as Julio had. So why were both affected so differently? The boy was still suffering from a painful throat, whereas the medic 
Ronaldo's victim seemed not to have experienced the same result. Lorenzo smiled and explained. You Thank haven't you. okay. Just just to clarify, because I'm going yes. back in the in the book here. Remember this name starts was poisoned by uh Leonardo Silva, right? Leonardo Silva gave him poison mixed with the wine. And Julio drank poison in a suicide in the past. Go ahead. Okay. You haven't taken the causes into consideration. Estevez was poisoned, whereas Julio poisoned himself. There's a big difference. Suicide entails the enormous complication of guilt. The mental fixation of remorse causes untold imbalances within the spirit body. The harm affects the recesses of the conscience, which creates and then concretes it. Concrete, concretes it. We saw Leonardo Pierce with the image of Estevez tormenting his mind, while Julio is ever seven, affected. <clears throat> affected due to deliberate wrongs he yielded to 80 years ago. The thought that unleashes him, unleashes evil becomes imprisoned in its own results because it fatally suffers consequences in the spirit body in which it manifests. And in light of my silent reflections, he added, it has to be that way. We arrived at Blandina's lovely residence and went in. Julio's crying inspired compassion. After he had greeted the devoted Mariana, who was assisting him with maternal zeal, the minister examined him. Somewhat troubled, he said to Blandina, let's not worry too much. I hope to en enable him to reincarnate a few days from now. Yes, that shouldn't be put off any longer, she replied. Obviously aware of our curiosity and of Hilario's interest in gathering more information and knowledge regarding the case, the instructor asked us to observe the unfortunate child, saying... Uh, thanks. Okay. So when they go back to Lada Benson, uh, where Julio is being treated by Mrs. Blandina, who is kind of the director of the house, and Mariana, who is one of the workers over there, who have taken the responsibility of care for Julio as with a mother, with a maternal love, taking care of him as much as he could. And Julio still suffers tremendously, and suffers tremendously primarily uh, with breathing, breathing problems with the, in the area of the the upper airway, airway, the, the throat area. <coughs> and Andre Luis and Hilario, who are following Clarence, they are question the fact that, wait a minute, both individuals, Stevas and Julio, had this the same poison, they drank the same poison. They um, they are having very different results from the co different consequences from those in the spiritual world. And what is the difference? And and Eclarence explained that the difference is huge. Stavis was victim of 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 murder. Someone else made him made him drink poison, and he died in consequence of that, as a victim of a murder. Julio, on the other on the other hand, committed a suicide. What is the difference? The difference that when you commit suicide, you are can you consider yourself three times uh, res uh, responsible for that act. One, you are the planner. You planned it. Two, you are the executioner of that plan. And three, you are the victim of your own plan. plan. Right? It's completely different from, from let's say, uh, Estevez, who is the victim of the plan for someone else and the execution of someone else. 
if uh, instead of scared, is there a responsibility for what has happened to him? Yes, like everyone else, but he did not plan it. Therefore, the guilty and the responsibility of the suicidal is extremely deep as the planner, executioner, and a victim of his uh, one's own plan. And it's take Julius, as you can see here, It's taken Julius a long time to recover from that um, damage that he caused to the area of, it, of the throat in his own um, petty spirit. He had a red shortened. He was he had basically the blessing of have shortened his reincarnation by an early death as he was a child by by drowning, which is in itself um, happened secondary to the damage in the in the area of the throat, the suffocation by water, find itself back in the spiritual world, it's still suffering tremendous in the area of the throat, secondary from secondary to the, the poison that he drank in previous incarnation. And he's still back in the spiritual world and is still suffering tremendous, tremendously because of that. And one of the greatest benefits of reincarnation is that when come, coming into the spiritual, to the physical body, it takes a little, a little buffer, it alleviates a little bit. As we're going to read here, his next reincarnation that's soon to happen, he will continue to have problems with the area, with the area that of the throat, the area of, of, the, of the respiratory, especially the upper airway system. We are coming to the end of here. But next, the continuation of this chapter, the second part of this chapter is a more important one because they'll be dealing with centers of energies. The relationship of the centers of energies in the petty spirit and in the physical body. And the centers of energies is basically the chakras, right? And then, and uh, Clyde Anse will give a very nice, very short and very synthesized um, lesson on those centers coming from the body he called the he calls the what is the name that one that he called the corona okay we'll call the crown chakras is another name that we use here too and he studied the relationship of each one of those centers the cerebral that we call the frontal the frontal that he's gonna call the throat and the relationship of each one of the centers of energies that we have in our petty spirit that of course has is responsible for the energies in specific parts of the physical body, right? So as if you move ahead, you can see the cardiac center has a relationship with the heart, the system, the vascular system. And you now if you think of the genetic as the respons responsibility of with the energies of the areas of reproduction and sexuality in us and so forth and so on. You go to each one of them, I think that's be quite interesting. And we'll explain why um, Julio still has tremendous, pro tremendous problems with the center of energy that deals with the truth and the the reason to it, he will reincarnate with problems dealing with the areas of the throat and the, and the upper airways uh, again. I think it'll be quite interesting. I was hoping to be able to do it today, but I guess I talked too much. Wasn't able to complete. But you completed chapter 20 next week, and I think it'll be 
a lot more interesting for us to go through. Any questions, any comments? Wait a minute, we, we under 12 or 12 story? So 12, is it? Well, yes. I blanked one minute here, you're under 12. Is there any questions, please? Any comments? Excuse me. Yes. My schedule says it goes to 12.30. It's 12.30. Yeah. It is? Yeah, it is 12.30. So it's 12.00. It's 12.30. Yeah, I blinked over here for a minute. Okay. <laughs> I thought I was going to raise it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's read a little more. Then, um... Okay. Okay. As you know, our body of ratified matter is inwardly governed by seven force centers, which come together in the branches of the plexus. As they vibrate in tune with one another, the inflow of the directive power of the mind they established for our use a vehicle of electrical cells, which we may define as an electro electromagnetic field in which thought vibrates within a closed circuit. Our mental position de determines the specific weight of our spirit envelope and consequently the habitat it needs. It's only a matter of vibratory pattern. Each of us lives within a certain type of wave. The more primitive the condition of the mind, the weaker the vibratory inflow of the thought, inducing the compulsory agglutination of the individual of the regions of embryotic or tormented awareness, where the inferior lie lives to which it is attuned come together. The increase of the mental flow within the electronic matic, magnetic vehicle in which we move after we abandon the earthly body depends on the experience that has been acquired and stored in our own spirit. With this reality in mind, is it is easy to understand that we either sublimate or unbalance the delicate agent of our manifestations according to the type of thought that flows from our inner life. The closer we are to the animal's fears, the greater the obscuring condensation of our organization. Whereas the more we use our efforts to evolve toward the glorious constructions of the spirit, the greater the subtlety of our envelope, which combines easily with the beauty, harmony, and the light that reign in the divine creation. We were enthralled by this priceless exam explanation, but since Clarenzo realized that we had manners, matters at hand, he turned his attention back to Julio's infirm throat and continued. Okay, thanks. Okay. So what is it that um, Clarence is telling us here? With, with the theory of relativity, thanks to Einstein, we know that energy is matter and matter is energy, is energy is just a matter of condensation of, the, of those energies, right? We, as incarnate being, we are spirit, very spirit, physical body. Once we leave the physical body behind, we are spirit, very spirit. The governor of everything, the leader of everything is the spirit. And the spirits govern the spiritual body that govern the spirit, the physical body through energy. And this energy is the mind, basically. Our sentiments, our love, hate, jealousy, um, anger, generates Thoughts, you know, we reach our mind and we generate thoughts. Thoughts is, is energy. 
that energy will pass to the that spirit that is that will pass to the physical body. How does it happen? The same way that there is different pathways for things to travel, you no know, air, um, uh, sound travels to air, it's proper uh, waves, wavelength, um, energy, electric energy goes through the wires and has its own way of reaching point A to point B. How does energy go from as the spirit mind to the very spirit? I we don't do not know, but it's transmitted in the in the very spirit and from the very spirit of the physical body through a railway called nerve nervous system the nervous system and. There is something called plexus, and the plexus is basically an area of a meeting of many different uh, nerves that comes from the higher up, let's say, using as an example the physical brain. When the brain it travels to some plexus, in those plexus they distribute itself, and you have major plexus at around the, um, the neck, at around the, the axilla, at around the, the groins. And for that, it distributes itself in different areas. Nerves that goes to the toes, nerves that goes to the knees, and, and, and so forth and so on, right? That is just a comparison of here that we make. So we have those plexus that is a, a congregation of of other of of, the, of nerves that comes from its origin, you know, in the brain, gets together with that, and then it's redistributed to other areas, right? As some of those um, airports, what is the what's the title that we gave? Like Atlanta, or like Chicago, or like Houston, that receives basically um, airplanes from all over the world and from there it distributes for all the smaller uh, airports, right? And of course the plexus receives energy and redistributes energy. Okay. And those plexus, those energies, we can see them as the centers of energies to which we are going to, to talk about now. But primarily, since the source is the spirit, the leader, the, the primary provider of that those energies is the spirit, and the spirit is the one who has the moral qualities and the intellectual qualities itself in both perispirit and physical body are just instruments of the spirit to be able to express the spirit's qualities, good and bad. When, those, when the, the qualities are good, when the spirit is more evolved, it will produce, it will generate energies that will reach the physical body, the, the perispirit first, and carrying good, pleasant health energies that produces good health physical body or state of health, so to say. And when this energy is produced by the spirit that derives from the sentiments, the goodness of the one has, the moral qualities that one has, it will produce health. When we as, as the spirit carries hate, carry thoughts of revenge, carry uh, thoughts of violence, will you propagate those energies to the, to the physical body? 
that will the same way propagate the opposite of health that will generate tremendous amounts of dark energies that could culminate with with the diseases. We have to be very careful not to some in such a sovereign from this because of the bad energies. We don't know what this no one, we don't know what's being happening right now to each individual. Let's say perhaps the individual that today is carrying a baggage of tremendous amount of health problems. You, you cannot assume that, that's, that that spirit is generating all those bad energies in the present. Let's use the case of Julio as an example. We don't know how Julio is going to be in the next reincarnation. We don't know how much he will be at that moment as the next reincarnation. Let's say his name is going to be John. That just it. His next name is going to be John. Julio, when he reincarnated again, is going to be John. You don't know how John is going to be. John, John will be a good individual with good positive energies, doing the best of in that opportunity to complete his his goals in reparation and being forgiven and everything else. Julius still gonna have the problems of the truth. It's already there. It 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 will function the physical body of of John as a buffer. It will suck in all the diseases that he imprints in his own petty spirit to that physical body. If as John he does his job of reparation, of repairing. When John died, the physical body dies, and now John, who in reality is Julio, goes back to the spiritual world. Now he's going to have a health body spirit because he removed everything that was the cause of illnesses, and now he has regained his his completely health to move on in the future. Could be the opposite way. Julio reincarnate as John may continue to be angry and compromise even more himself and go back, come back to the spiritual world, even worse situation. Because all comes from the energies that we emanate from ourselves as the spirit that you go through the physical body to the, to the peri spirit first. And the peri spirit is the one that forms the physical body. And some of the, the problems of the physical body will be directly affect the physical body, regardless of what that person happens to be in that next reincarnation. So Julio is getting ready to a reincarnation. Julio has tremendous probably the centers of energies that, that deals with the truth. And Julio will reincarnate soon with problems with problems with with that center of, of energy that will compromise his physical body in that very next reincarnation. How is going to use the opportunity? That is where the biggest thing that we got gives us the free will comes into play. Okay, you have problem with with your troth. You have have to deal with some health issues. How do you deal with that? And how do you use that opportunity as an instrument of growth of the eternal spirit? So we can go back to the spiritual world spirits world in much better shape with uh, repaired, so to say, very spirit. And you know you come from the energy that one emanates as a spirit that will create the process of regeneration or using of you will complicate those situations even more. That's where you will find yourself.
Any questions? Okay. We continue. Yep. We cannot avoid practical observations when we study the conflicts of the soul. Whatever the corruption of the thought is, such will be the disharmony and the practical force centers that reacts in our body to this or that class of mental inflow. Let's apply earthly terminology to our short lesson as much as possible so that you can better grasp what we were saying as we analyze the physiology of the prior spirit, we may classify its four centers by remembering the most important areas of the physical body, thus using the best expression for the vehicle that serves us pre presently. There is the crown center, which on earth is considered by the Hindu philosoph philosophy as being the thought petal lotus and the most important center of all due to its high radiation potential and its connection with the mind, the shining seat of the consciousness. The crown center receives, first of all, the stimuli of the spirit, commanding the other centers, yet vibrating with them in a perfect system of independency. Considering in our exposition of exposition the phenomenon of the physical body, and satisfying the imperative of simplicity in our definitions, we can say that energies of nourishment for the nervous system is subdivision emanate from the center, that it is responsible for feeding the thought cells and for providing all the electron electromagnetic resources that are indispensable for organic stability. Therefore, it is greater similar of the solar energies and rays from the higher rims that can favor the sublimation of the soul. Next, there is the cerebral center, contiguous, contiguous to the crown center, which orders the various types of perception, which in the physical body comprise sight, hearing, touch, and the vast network of the processes of the mind that have to do with speech, learning, art, and knowledge. It is in the cerebral center that we possess the command of the indoctrine center, which has to do with the psychic powers. Next, there is the throat center, which presides over the vocal phenomenon, including the activities of the thymus, the thyroid, and the parathyroid. Then there is the heart center, which sustains the services of the emotions and overlook equilibrium. Proceeding on down, there is the splenic center, which in the dense body is seated with the spleen and regulates the distribution in the circulation adequate for the vital resources in every corner of the body. Then comes a gastric center, which controls the entrance of nourishment and fluids into the body. And lastly is the gymnastic center, housing the sanctuary of sex as molding temple of forms and stimuli. The instructor posed, paused briefly to rest and then continued. But we mustn't forget that our subtle vehicle like the physical one is a mental creation on the evolutionary pathway woven out of resources taken temporarily by us from the storehouses of the universe. It is a vessel that we utilize to house the divine light sublimation in our eternal individuality with which we must seek the rims of pure spirit. Everything is the work of the mind in time and space making use of thousands of forms in order to become purified and sanctified for the divine glory. Lorenzo stroked the boy's ailing throat, indicating that it was the object of our lesson and added, when by acts contrary to the divine law, our mind harms the harmony of any one of our soul's four centers. It is naturally enslaved to the effects of the unbalancing action, thus making the toil of readjustment necessary. In Julio's case, he is the author of Disturbance in Throat Center, an alteration expressed by infirmity or imbalance that will be necessary, will be by necess necessity go with him into reincarnation. How will he cleanse the deficiency? I asked, edified by the explanation I had just heard. In a very sense, serene throat, the instructor answered. Julio will have to live with pain in his throat thus healing himself by correcting the vibratorial tonus, 
of the throat center and reestablishing it to the, to normality and to and to edge his explanation more surely on our minds, he concluded. Julio will be reborn in a physiological defective body, which will somehow portray the injured area, his throat. He will suffer intensely from the vocal organ, which will undoubtedly be characterized by weak resistance to microbial attacks. In virtue of our friend having scorned the blessing of a physical body, he will be faced with dreadful struggles in order to learn how to appreciate it instead. Then the instructor performed several magnetic operations to help the little patient who remained calm. And after the two kindly sisters expressed their gratitude, we said goodbye and returned to our spirit home. All right, thank you, Sarayda. You're welcome. Well, fortunately, we were able to finish the chapter, and I'm glad. Thank you, Philip, to remind me. I blanked away on timing. I did too. <clears throat> so, in the, in the first part of the chapter, Clarence gives us the understanding that the distribution of, of energy is generated primarily by us, the Eternal Spirit which is primarily um, a mirror. Our energy is a mirror of our emotional, um, sentimental state, which is directed equally directly to our state of moral progress the more sublimized morally individual you create thoughts of forgiveness. We don't even have to generate thoughts of forgiveness because being so evolved, we will not be offended by other individuals. Therefore, you will not have to, to forgive. But most of us are still up far behind in that path. We find ourselves offended. We find ourselves hurted. We suffer for the action of others, and some of us are able to forgive directly and move on. Some of us are not really able to forgive, but be smart enough to not seek revenge and just let justice at the hands of God. And some of us are not able to do neither and choose to seek revenge, choose to make justice with our own hands. And I'm using um, forgiveness and forgiveness as one example, but you can take all kinds of sentiments that we generate. Jealousy is an extremely harmful thing for the physical body. Being jealous is extremely troublesome, troublesome in the generation of very harmful energies to all bodies. Envy, greed, all those vices, you really promote an array of dark negative energies that will travel from the us, the spirit. And again, we don't, I don't think we can explain how it goes from the spirit to the peri spirit, or if, if it's one and only thing go together in terms of energies, of course. Uh, we don't know yet, but we know that it's then distribute these energies. It's starting from the, the brown chakra or center of energy. Chakra is the terminology used in Hinduism that I myself found myself repeating time and time, but in spiritism, we should use center of energy. So I apologize for using the word chakra very often, but if I do say, you understand I'm referring to centers of energies. The Hindus have studied and understood these things quite a few, couple of thousand years before Christ, at least, they, that they know the centers of energy because they pay attention to energy a lot more than the Western civilizations. So does the, 
the Buddhism, we have a good understanding of that, that there as well, when we are just starting to understand this better now. Clarence explained to us here that the most important, it's not the most important, but the one that's directly connected with the spirit and therefore with the spirituality, and therefore the one that is able to receive the most assistance, energies from the from the spiritual world, is with the crown chakra, the ones right on the top of the head, that is called the um, 1,000 petals, because it's, it's size, because it's brightness, and because of its connection with the, with the spiritual world more extensively, it's like a big sun, and the rest of the, the sense of energy to be like the the planets that receive the energies from that big sun. The the crown chakra is directly connected with this with the spirituality with the spirit, and therefore receive directly all the energies that we produce plus the assistance, the energies that come from the spiritual world, and depends with whom we tune ourselves, those energies will be good or bad. How does um, obsessors may affect our health? Generate, putting up energies that are taken by the spirit and are going to directing that in that crown center of, of energy and being perhaps responsible for causing some of the disease, disease, being psychiatric or even organic diseases. Following down, you have the what we call the, the frontal chakra that Clarence calls the cerebral chakra uh, center of energy over here that deals With the intellect, deals with the senses, hearing, seeing, tactile, all those, all those sensations. They're involved with the brain itself, itself, you know, and has a very close association with the with the with the ground chakra, and therefore receives tremendous volume of this the 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 spiritual energies directly as well. Going down, we have what we call the laryngeal center of energy, the clarence calls the trough. Uh, deals tremendously with sentiments, deals tremendously with emotions. When you depends on the state of emotion, you feel that your throat is extremely dry, you feel that it's being squeezed, then you can even can hardly talk. Depends on the emotional state, right? You have a shock, somebody to tell you love so much has just discarnate. You felt the thing in your throat almost as if the throat is squeezing you, can even speak for a few minutes. You lose the ability to speak because that center of energy deals direct with emotions. <laughs> as, as a note, each one of those centers of energy has a respected the land in the endocrine system. So Clarence says over here that the frontal uh, is associated with with our psychic abilities, mediumship, because it's also directed with a very important gland, the pineal gland, that we understand being the gland that creates that open window with the spiritual world for mediums to have a more or less extensive mediumship, but all of us have a degree of, of mediumship as well. It also has direct relationship with the, the hypothalamus that governs the pituitary gland, and those two together are responsible for the maintenance and well-being or most of the other glands all throughout the body. It's extremely important. And we can see here how our thoughts, our sentiments have a direct um, effect 
in the functioning, the phys physiology of the physical body. Going down, uh, you have the cardiac, that is the one that we say with the heart, and other expressions of love or sentiment, responsible for the muscle heart itself, for the vascular system. Um, tremendous affected with emotions as well. Going down, you have the gastric, responsible for the functioning of the nourishment, the gastrointestinal parts with the livers, with the pancreas, all that deals with nourishment, uh, absorption of energies, elimination of waste, all that. And you can see, as we're talking about going from that frontal chakra down to the frontal, down to the heart, to, to, to the gastric, they will deal tremendously with emotion. Have individuals will have a diarrhea because of emotional distress. And that's because, as we spoke about, energy is traveling through that pathway called nervous system. Now those nerves associated. And if you say there's a big nerve, nerve called the vagus, that affects the trough as it comes down from the brain. It affects directly the heart. It affects directly the, st the stomach. One of the surgeries that are done in the past was to disconnect the vagus nerve from the heart, from the stomach to help individuals with reflux, which is not, not done anymore because it, you figure out it can cause more harm than good. But in the past was one of the alternatives for people with, uh, with severe heartburn that was to disconnect that nerve because it deals with emotions. And emotions is direct direct relationship with our moral progress. The individual with elevate moral progress, you never allow those emotions to be so up or lower to dis to cause distresses. You'll be balanced, you'll be in harmony, not to far to the right, not to far to the left, to cause any kind of imbalances. Going down, you have the splenic, that deals with the circulation, that deals with the health of the blood, blood must circulate, that deals with uh, the immune systems as well, and traveling down. But when I say traveling down, just I'm saying anatomically speaking, okay? I'm not saying one more important than the other going down in terms of quality, but they were equally important. You have the genetics that deals with reproduction, that deals with the responsibilities of sexual energies. And we see that sexual energy has direct relationship with the frontal, as, the frontal chakra as well. And the frontal chakra, again, going back to the pituitary gland, has direct effect in the, in the hormones that use of sexuality. So everything is connected. Everything has a direct uh, effect on everything. But the greater generator is as the spirit. And all derives from what, it pro what we produce in terms of energies on our sentiments. Hate versus love, forgiveness versus revenge, so forth and so on. Greed versus charity or benevolence, right? Choice is ours, but what we want to produce to ourselves, what we are able to produce to ourselves. In the, in the pathway of progress, we receive all the assistance to elevate our sentiments. And if all those lessons are important for us to take home, not only the soap opera that, that was present over here, we always got to go back to the teachings of Christ. That at the end of this forgiveness is the end of his ability to love one another as brothers and sisters, regardless of the, the title or the relationship that we are having this present incarnation. 
brother, sister, wife, husband, mother, son, daughter. At the end, we are all brothers and sisters we must love one another. Neighbor, um, different religions, whatever we think, different nationalities. The necessity of love one another is what creates us in that perfect state of harmony with our own conscience to generate sentiments that are extremely healthy for, for all of us. Because it's the imbalance or disharmony of what we generate in relationship to the divine laws that we have in our conscience, the genesis for most of the problems that we have. And especially for in association with this book, the necessity to forgive, to let go of the past, to assume the position of brothers and sisters that forgives one another all the mistakes that you have done. And again, do not repeat those mistakes again. Comments, questions? Okay, time is up. It's six minutes over, as usual, with me. Um, so, right, can I make the final prayer, please? Yes, of course, Mama. And as we come to the end of this beautiful lesson today, to our Father, our teacher, our mentor, to our spiritual benefactors and guardian angels, we give you thanks as we receive the blessings of understanding, of loving one another and forgiving ourselves. These lessons that are so important to our lives here today, to take with us, to improve, to work, and understand that we're not alone. We thank you, dear Lord, for these blessings today. We ask as we leave here today, dear Lord, that we continue to pray for all those that are suffering still at war, in illnesses, in hospitals, and all that continue to receive our blessings. May our Father be with them always. We pray, dear Father, for our SGNY, the United States Spirit Council, the United States Spirit Federation that continue to inspire us with the teaching of spiritism. May we take this with us, dear Lord, and continue our part in continuing our work and studies. And may we always remember to keep our prayers in our homes for our families and loved ones, and especially send a prayer to our sister who passed away, Vera, on go for the family and loved ones that are with her. We continue to pray for her for peace and love in the spiritual world now. As we come to the end, dear Father, may we continue to follow our study groups throughout the week, continue with prayers, dear Father, in guiding and helping the world that is so much in need. We thank you for this meeting today and be able to return again next week to continue our studies. We thank our teacher and all that continue to inspire us. And with this in mind, dear Lord, we ask permission to close our meeting today. So be it. So be it. Thanks, everyone. Next week, oh, we have this the gospel across the spirit is. And for those who attend tomorrow, we will have our meeting tomorrow, okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank Hello. you very much. Thank you. Beautiful meeting. Thank you. Thank you.